So to do the slide deck now, when you press record, I will put the slides on my screen and press share. Yes, but okay. uh, first I'm gonna, for, so we have Ben Malcolm. So Ben Malcolm is um, part of a psychedelic super couple. Um, when you, you talk, when you do talk about hashtag relationship goals, um, they come up. <laughs> um, he and uh, Ben is known as the spirit pharmacist and he teaches people about um, drug interactions and the way that they um, um, work pharmacologically inside your body. Um, his wife, Cherie, leads integration circles and does integration work down in, in Los Angeles. And I'm, I'm quite inspired by the both of you. And I am just couldn't be more thrilled that uh, we got you on the the summit in in all the ways. So welcome welcome to the summit and welcome everybody else to uh, the 920 psilocybin summit. Uh, four days of the celebration of the myth, magic, science, and culture of the sacred mushroom. Ben, welcome. Okay, so share uh, if you would like to. Okay, how are we doing here? I see the screen. Does everybody else see the screen? Looks good. Gavin says looks good. We're here. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, major gratitude for your patience there while uh, I learned how to use Zoom. Um, we're going to be talking about pharmacology today and you know of course this is the psilocybin summit so we're going to be focusing on psilocybin um just a few words of advice or uh, disclosures disclaimers i do do private consulting i answer drug information questions about psychedelics uh through my website spiritpharmacist.com but i'm not involved in developing any psychedelics through uh research and develop companies i also have no other financial conflicts with uh, the pharmaceutical industry that you need to um, be aware of. Um, you know, in this presentation, we're gonna discuss psilocybin. It is both an illicit drug uh, federally as well as an experimental drug now that it's in, in clinical trials, uh, but it is not uh, quite yet a legal drug. It is decriminalized in a couple of cities, but um, you know, we're talking informational here today. Um, and then of course, you know, I'm not recommending that you break the law. So we're gonna start with uh, kind of just going through an overview of psilocybin pharmacology uh, that will then kind of introduce the modality of psilocybin assisted therapy. We'll kind of discuss psilocybin assisted therapy in the context of mental illness and then we'll kind of finish with a, a bird's eye overview of the clinical studies that have been done to date with psilocybin. So uh, psilocybin is actually 4-phosphoryloxy NN dimethyltryptamine. Uh, so this is a, kind of interesting that it isn't actually a, a DMT uh, analog itself. And, you know, sometimes when you hear psilocybin, DMT, 5-MeO, DMT, you know, maybe you start thinking that psilocybin is, is very much different than those other tryptamine compounds, but uh, it's actually quite similar to, to many of the others. Uh, there's some pharmacology Greek in this presentation. Uh, so here's a, a glossary of terms that, um, you know, hopefully in the, the recording, you know, if you're listening to it later or something like that, you'll be able to kind of come back and, and decode the um, uh, pharmacology abbreviations I have here. So um, primarily we're going to be talking about serotonin, which is 5-hydroxytryptamine. It's the primary uh, neurotransmitter that's affected by most classic psychedelics. And by the classics, I mean things like LSD, uh, psilocybin, uh, MDMA, mescaline, uh, whereas, you know, non-classics would be things like ketamine or, or ibogaine that seem to work on different types of neurotransmitters. And then there are many different types of serotonin receptors, 14 subtypes in total that we've discovered to date, but it's really the serotonin 2A receptor that we think is kind of driving the bus as far as uh, the receptor that is stimulated to produce uh, a psychedelic experience. So uh, I'm not a historian, but psilocybin mushrooms do grow uh, worldwide. There's over 200 species. Um, they've been used by indigenous cultures for 
thousands of years. And, uh, you know, did they use them to party? Nah, pr probably not. I mean, you could kind of look at the name here and I'm not going to say it because I'll just absolutely butcher it, but roughly translated means flesh of the gods. So again, kind of uh, hearkening back to this idea that psychedelics are primarily uh, spiritual in nature and for connecting with the divine rather than, you know, having a good time or, or something like that. Not that there's anything wrong with that or that you can't do that. Um, but, you know, historically, that doesn't seem how they're used from the anthropologic record. Uh, psilocybin and psilocin were actually first isolated by the man that synthesized LSD, Albert Hoffman, in the 1950s. Psilocybin was officially made illegal in the United States by the federal government when they passed the Controlled Substance Act in 1970. Psilocybin and psilocybin containing mushrooms are incredibly safe drugs and uh, for several years in a row now, they've been championed the safest recreational drug as far as this global drug survey, which is the largest survey of recreational drug use that uh, happens uh, on an annual basis. Uh, at the moment, psilocybin and specifically psilocybin assisted psychotherapy has been given a breakthrough designation for treatment resistant uh, depression. So at this point, you know, what does that mean? It kind of means that the FDA is incredibly interested in turning it into a medicine and has sort of greased the path by giving it a breakthrough designation, which uh, uh, some, removes some of the barriers and um, you know, it's kind of an expedited application. Um, kind of like in the TSA where they have like the fast track lane that you can kind of go through, like the TSA pre-check is kind of like the breakthrough designation. Also, as I mentioned, the decriminalization movement is, is gaining traction and you know, I believe there are other talks about decriminalization in the summit, so I'll let those speakers uh, talk about that. So here's uh, just some, an overview of psychedelic drug classes. Probably phenethylamines and tryptamines are the, the most famous. Uh, Dr. Alexander Shulgin or Sasha Shulgin wrote two books, Phenethylamines I've Known and Loved, as well as Tryptamines I Have uh, Known and Loved, where he goes into detail, and, uh, along with his wife, actually, Anne Shulgin's also a co-author on, on both of those, uh, kind of telling their love story uh, through the lens of all of these uh, amazing compounds that he uh, uh, synthesized. And, you know, some of them he resynthesized and some of them, you know, he actually came up with by, him, by himself and synthesized brand new compounds. And, you know, I think uh, the most important part of the slide here is, is psilocybin today. You see it belongs to the tryptamine family of, of psychedelics. And uh, when it comes to the, the psychedelics, both the phenethylamines and the tryptamines we think produce the, their psychedelic experience primarily by stimulating serotonin 2A receptors. Okay, so here's a, a, a picture of a, a serotonin neuronal synapse kind of contrasting those two classes of psychedelics, the phenethylamines and the tryptamines. And, uh, you know, I think you can see my mouse here. Is that correct? I hope so. Well, uh, I'll kind of walk you through it. This is the presynaptic neuron. So this is where the signal is coming from. This is the postsynaptic neuron. So this is where the signal is going to. And what happens is you have, you see uh, tryptophan, 5-HTP, 5-HT. So here's serotonin and it's packaged into these things called vesicles by this protein called VMAT2. And when a signal comes down here normally, this vesicle would release serotonin into the synapse. Now drugs like phenethylamines or MDMA kind of cause a dumping of serotonin into the synapse. So rather than um, getting serotonin two-way activation via direct stimulation of the receptor, it seems that phenethylamines like MDMA is primarily a serotonin releasing type of mechanism. Now, once the serotonin has been released into the synapse, then it is free to bind with the postsynaptic receptor. And this is a serotonin receptor here. So it's our serotonin 2A receptor. And most tryptamines like psilocybin actually act by stimulating serotonin 2A receptors directly. Now, uh, not so important for this talk, but um, you know, perhaps to make some connections with other psychedelics out there or uh, psychotropic drugs, you see there's MAO here or monoamine oxidase. So monoamine oxidase is inhibited by the ayahuasca vine and that's an important part of making DMT orally active, but also increases risks of uh, drug interactions with other drugs that increase serotonin in the synapse. So drugs would be well, MDMA and MAOIs. Well, that MDMA releases serotonin and if you block MAO, well, it can't be get broken down. So that's definitely going to increase it. 
And then you see CERT here, uh, which is a, another mechanism for serotonin to be removed from the synapse. These are blocked by the standard antidepressants like SSRIs. They're selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They, they block this CERT pump and they essentially trap serotonin in the synapse. So again, with MAOIs, you're going to run into a lot of problems. Uh, you know, this is a very reductionist type of diagram here. Uh, psychedelics certainly have other mechanisms of action. And, you know, I think as time goes on, we're going to learn more and more about the contributions of those. Here's a, just a, some, some structures of different types of tryptamine psychedelics. And you have a serotonin over here on the far left-hand side of the slide. This is your neurotransmitter. And then you can kind of see the similarity across the board between serotonin and all of these other tryptamine-based psychedelics. And you know, we see psilocybin here. Uh, LSD is a little bit different in that it's a, a rigidified type of thing, but it still has the indole alkylamine ring. And then one, two carbons later, you see the nitrogen. One, two carbon, one, two carbon, you kind of see the nitrogen here. So essentially tryptamine psychedelics are all serotonin analogs. They look fairly similar to serotonin and they modulate the, the serotonin um, uh, neurotransmitter system. Uh, interestingly, and I think this is an area that's, that's being explored more and more, uh, especially uh, David Nichols has done a lot of work with LSD around this, is that it seems that tryptamines are functionally selective at serotonin or serotonin two-way receptors, meaning that even though all of these drugs bind the receptors, different signaling pathways are possible on the inside of the cell. So just because there's one receptor doesn't mean that there's only a single uh, pathway on the inside of the cell. And it's just incredibly interesting that, you know, binding a receptor a little bit differently on the outside could actually cause a different message to be sent to the, the inside of the, the cell or the receiving neuron. Uh, psilocybin is Perhaps not even the, the, the active component of psilocybin containing mushrooms, it's probably psilocin that's mostly driving uh, the psychedelic effects. It's a very similar uh, a drug to psilocybin and it also binds serotonin 2A as well as uh, 1A receptors. So, you know, where is this happening in your brain, this kind of increase in serotonin, or uh, it would be more accurate to say a, a binding of postsynaptic serotonin receptors by tryptamine psychedelics. Well, there's two major uh, nuclei in the brain, the RAFE nuclei. These are large serotonin containing nuclei. And what you see is that they project uh, all over the place, really. But really, you see it kind of up to the prefrontal cortex and to the rest of the cortex. And the, the cerebral cortex is very, very rich in serotonin 2A receptors. Uh, so uh, we kind of think that a lot of the thought distortions or changes in the way we think uh, and perceive the world with psychedelics have to do with serotonin 2A binding in cortical layers. The emotional brain or the limbic system also has serotonin projections. There are serotonin 2A receptors here, uh, but um, you know it's primarily rich in serotonin 1A receptors, and you know perhaps this has uh, something to do with uh, you know kind of profound emotional types of uh, effects that that psilocybin is able to produce. So here is how uh, you know the relationship between psilocybin and psilocin as well as, as the metabolism. So um, you, what you see is psilocybin uh, being dephosphorylated. And this actually happens in your intestine prior to absorption or maybe in the liver just after absorption. And it's metabolized to this active metabolite, which is psilocin. And that's why I say that, you know, it's probably psilocin that's driving the psychedelic experience mostly uh, because psilocybin is converted into psilocin uh, mostly before it even reaches the bloodstream. Now, uh, as far as psilocin being metabolized, it, it is metabolized by the liver uh, to inactive metabolites. And then finally, those inactive metabolites are excreted uh, by your kidney. So in clinical trials that have uh, looked at psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy in, in life-threatening illness, which is mostly people with progressive cancers, uh, they excluded persons that had poor liver or, or kidney function. And in the world of uh, pharmacology or pharmacy, you know, someone that has compromised end organ function, like liver function or compromised kidney function, it doesn't necessarily mean that they 
are absolutely contraindicated and they can never use the drug or the substance. Uh, what it does mean is that they probably need less of the drug to get the same effect because they're not able to metabolize it the same way um, that a healthy individual would be able to. As far as the dosing and the timeline, you know, there's kind of a wide range in uh, active doses and, you know, certainly this varies by the, the strain of mushrooms that you're talking about or the, the potency of, of the species. Probably a typical dose is one to five grams and, you know, really probably a typical kind of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy type of dose is going to be three to five grams. Uh, it's kind of a black box in some ways because in the psilocybin assisted psychotherapy trials, they're using pure psilocybin. Uh, so unless you know, you know, you know how much psilocybin per weight is in your dried mushrooms, uh, you're kind of just ballparking around um, the, the type of dose, but it seems somewhere between three and five grams is probably going to be fairly similar to, um, you know, the 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 mg per kg that they would use in a clinical trial. Uh, you know, when you ingest mushrooms or uh, psilocybin, uh, usually onset 30 to 60 minutes, you're peaking in the first one to two hours, and then the duration of the experience, um, at least the intense part, is usually around four to six hours. And, you know, certainly there's a you know, an afterglow type of phenomenon where you're pretty much mentally back at baseline, but maybe, uh, you know, feeling some of the, the, uh, the emotional effects of, of psilocybin still. Um, food does slow and, and decrease the absorption. So, um, you know, for, for a full effect, you know, best on an empty stomach or maybe just a light meal. Okay, let's talk a little bit about psilocybin assisted psychotherapy. So what it is, it is a modality of treatment in which a drug, in this case a psychedelic, is used to augment psychotherapy. And what does it look like or what does it consist of? Well, there, there is a finite number of sessions, usually one to three. It seems like one to two for most of the psilocybin trials, two to three for most of the uh, MDMA trials. And then, um, you know, within these drug-assisted psychotherapy sessions, they have these kind of weekly follow-up uh, psychotherapy sessions that are typically uh, 60 to 90 minutes in length. And the non-drug sessions um, are kind of focused on preparing for the person for the experience or, or going through some of the material or, or intentions that they're hoping to, to work on. And then afterwards, it's about reassimilation integrating their experience and, you know, getting them to uh, whatever goal that they had before they, um, you know, kind of embarked on their journey through the, the trial. Uh, the drug sessions uh, for MDMA are spaced definitely a month apart. For psilocybin, there's a little more variability. Some, some trials really only space them as, as far as a week apart, whereas others, you know, it is a couple of weeks to, to more like a month. So here's a, a trial design um, by uh, author Ross and, and his group. And uh, this is a, a, a trial design that they did for psilocybin and life-threatening illness. And I'm just gonna kind of point out uh, a few landmarks here. You know, you see again, preparation. They did three sessions, which is six hours total. So it sounds like two hours a session. And then, you know, they have a psilocybin treatment or niacin. They use an active control instead of a placebo in this group. And then you see that, uh, you know, there's essentially uh, looks like um, six weeks post day one or seven weeks post day one is the next treatment. So it looks like there's a six or seven week break and they're doing six hours of psychotherapy again there. You get the second treatment, but you know, it's a switch. It's a crossover. So if you got the active control niacin, you're getting psilocybin next and, and vice versa. If you, if you got psilocybin first, you're getting active control next. So even though there's two drug session days in this trial, they're really only being dosed with psilocybin one time. And then afterwards, again, you have your six hours of psychotherapy over six weeks. And then the, the, the um, uh, study support uh, actually continues for, it looks like about half a year or six months afterwards. And, you know, is this ongoing structured support or just kind of as needed availability if, if things come up? Probably more that the as needed uh, availability. So how is it conducted? You know, usually the, the drug sessions are six to eight hours in length. Uh, kind of the gold standard uh, right now, at least in the clinical trials, is this dyad or couple of, of a male and a female therapist. Uh, the environment is very, very important. I'm sure there, someone's going to cover set and setting in the, in the psilocybin summit, but uh, they have ambient surroundings, eye shades, and then evocative, meaning emotion producing 
uh, type of type of music. And you know, many people really feel that music is the hidden therapist in psychedelic assisted psychotherapies. And you know, certainly there's a a large um, history of of using music or using. Uh, uh, a song uh, from a shamanistic perspective in traditional uses of, of psychedelics uh, around the world. Uh, the therapist, especially in psilocybin therapy, is encouraged to assume a, a non-directive and supportive role. So it's not, well, let me ingest psilocybin, wait an hour, and then, oh, tell me about your depression. You know, they're not prompting the people like that. It's more, uh, you know, supposed to be an internal experience, an internal experience, I should say, um, you know, where uh, the therapist is really just there to support them if emotional difficulty arises um, or, you know, they need something else, glass of water, go to the restroom, things like that. So here's a picture of the mushroom room at Johns Hopkins. And uh, you, you can see uh, a lot of the elements that I talked about on the previous slide. You've got your dyad of uh, uh, male and female therapist. You can see she has her eye shades here. Uh, you can't really tell, maybe there's a speaker, maybe there's some headphones, but, but she is listening to some evocative music. And, and what you can see here is this looks very far from kind of the standard clinical office or, or doctor's office. You know, she's kind of laying down. It looks like she is getting some type of a, a support through light touch here. Uh, and then the, the surroundings, again, it looks like there's a, there's a mushroom themed lamp. Uh, this picture looks pretty cool on the wall. And then, yeah, that rug has a, has a pretty cool uh, design to it. So you can see that they really kind of went out of their way to keep the lighting ambient. They have a lot of lamps here. They don't have the kind of standard white fluorescent, uh, super bright lights that you might uh, find in a normal doctor's office. So legality and ethics, you know, again, psilocybin is an, an illicit and experimental drug right now. So it would essentially be illegal, at least in the United States, to provide psilocybin assisted psychotherapy outside of a clinical trial environment. Uh, psychedelics in general, not just psilocybin, really put the person in a profound non-ordinary state of consciousness. They're open, usually they're very open to suggestion. Uh, they're vulnerable. Um, so there have been cases where people end up getting manipulated or, or exploited uh, in this type of circumstance. So, you know, really, exactly, we need some additional safeguards to make sure that, that these drugs are, are used uh, ethically. Um, really, unfortunately, and, and kind of even mind-blowingly, there have been cases of sexual, sexual abuse and assault occurring within uh, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy settings and um, not necessarily in the, in the underground. Um, and this is part of the reason why the diet of male and female therapists is recommended. Well, you can cover the other person if they need to go to the restroom, sure. But at the same time, you know, I think it's about, um, you know, uh, an enhanced ability to deal with transference and, and counter transference and, and enhanced accountability uh, because, you know, you're not in there with the participant by yourself or, or alone. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, training programs, you know, what do you need to be able to do to, to be kind of skilled at this? Well, you know, you should probably um, have some experience supporting psychiatric crises, um, you know, not so much with psilocybin, it's an incredibly safe drug physically, but, you know, maybe some of the other medicines, there, there are some physical risks, so maybe some uh, emergency preparedness, or at least an idea of what you would do if an emergency did come up. Um, of course, confidentiality, we're talking about um, a medical use of psilocybin here. So the same types of uh, privacy protections to medical uh, information um, definitely abides or, or is applicable, I should say. Um, building a lot of alliance and trust. And this is probably part of the reason why there's such an extensive amount of psychotherapy before the session is because uh, essentially, you want to be with someone in a room that you really trust when you're under the influence of a, of a psychedelic. So building that therapeutic alliance is, is critically important. And then, you know, finally, just having clear boundaries. And, um, you know, if you are going to employ touch, make sure you have permission beforehand. And then again, before you touch the person under the influence of the psychedelic, make sure that you just kind of check in with them that it's that it's okay that you're doing that. And you know, uh, I think it might be considered unethical by some to, to provide psilocybin um, or a psychedelic with, without support. And, um, you know, I think this kind of depends, right? If it's, if it's the case of someone's coming to you and saying, hey, I have depression and I really want to get something out of it. And you're just giving them a handful of mushrooms and saying, hey, uh, go eat those. You're probably going to get better. Uh, let, let me know how it goes. Well, you know, you've kind of just not done any of the things that... Um, you know, at least in my opinion, probably make the, the therapy um, more effective. Um, and you're kind of um, 
letting the person fend for themselves with a, with a psychedelic. Uh, you know, I think it gets different when people are healthy, they're looking for spiritual exploration, they're not necessarily coming to you and, and asking for a, a therapeutic environment or, or a therapeutic um, experience. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, psychedelics or psilocybin with mental illness. And, you know, um, for better or worse, Michael Pollan's book really did put the word out there and has made a lot of people very, very interested in psychedelics and, and psychedelic healing. And so, you know, now more than ever, more people are just very interested in psychedelics and this modality of healing. Uh, this is just kind of the truth about illness in general, but maybe particularly mental illness is that when illness gets bad, and people don't have great options to treat themselves um, or have tried to access options through uh, the traditional medical system that have not worked for them, they start to feel really desperate. And you know, this may increase their vulnerability as they're more willing to take risks or you know, ignore some red flags maybe on their, on their way because they're just kind of, they're not seeing um, a lot of the signposts along the way that you know, maybe they should be seeing. Um, to go about this modality safely. And, you know, I, I don't want to trash the world of underground psychedelic healing. It really has a lot of really exceptional healers and people that have tons of experience. Uh, they're earnest, they're beautiful, they have tons of integrity. But, you know, on the flip side of that, we're talking about unregulated or illicit types of, of substances here. And, you know, whenever you have a black market, you kind of inevitably maybe, uh, you know, attract some bad actors along the way. And, you know, there have been stories, cases of, you know, abusers, manipulators, womanizers, um, even psychopaths kind of getting a hold of, of psychedelics and, um, you know, doing a lot of damage with people because of it. So um, I think the take home here is that, you know, just have a lot of care, do your research, do your homework. Um, a lot of intention should go into creating the space that you're going to heal in. So overall, psilocybin does appear to fortify positive mental hygiene. People adopt mindful practices, maybe they eat better, things like that. Um, and they help heal mental illness. But um, you know, it would be kind of naive to say that there aren't risks or, or harms or, um, you know, notable exceptions to this kind of overall trend. So when we look at the general population, uh, you know, people that, that don't have mental illness that have used a classic psychedelic like psilocybin in the past year, uh, use is actually associated with a lower rate of mental illness. And this doesn't mean that it caused that, it's just an, an association, but it is out there and it's fairly reassuring that, you know, when people are using psychedelics in the general population, that they're not increasing their risk of, of mental illness. In the forensic population, so I'm talking about, uh, you know, uh, people that have been in prison, essentially, uh, we see lower rates of recidivism or uh, coming back to the forensic setting or coming back to prison, lower rates of uh, domestic violence, property crimes, um, with psychedelic use, including uh, psilocybin. Uh, psychedelics are fairly well known to be contraindicated in uh, severe mental illnesses such as uh, schizophrenia uh, or bipolar disorder. From the clinical studies that we have to date, it does seem that people with depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, life-threatening illness, or uh, potentially sub substance use disorders, alcohol use disorder, or, or uh, tobacco use disorder, quitting cigarettes have some uh, kind of pilot data for it. So those are the types of mental illnesses that um, at least so far appear to be amenable to psilocybin assisted uh, therapies. You know, while the persons in these depression studies are treatment refractory, I'm not sure that they're typically in the most severe cases because their definition of treatment refractory is, well, you have to have failed a few of the first line, two of the first line standard antidepressants. And it's actually not that hard to do. Um, probably most people try a couple of drugs before they find one that works for them, if they find one that works for them. And in these trials, they exclude people that are actively suicidal or have been suicidal in the past six months. So even though they've tried and failed a couple of drugs, yes, they do have depression. Um, yes, sometimes the depression is, um, bad, um, they're actually probably not the most severe cases of depression that exist out there in the, the world. And, you know, the psychotropic medications um, may introduce risks. Um, they also may interfere with benefits. A lot of them are either suspected or known 
to uh, blunt or decrease subjective experiences with psychedelics. And, you know, you can imagine if you're coming into this and you've invested all of this to have this kind of uh, mystical type of experience, and then you kind of have a, have a dud journey, um, you're going to be really disappointed. Uh, you're not going to get what you want out of it. And, you know, maybe that would actually make you feel more, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> make you feel more hopeless. Uh, so, you know, maybe there's risk in uh, blunted or, or reduced experiences as well. As far as extra uh, pharmacologic support, you know, these clinical studies, again, do a lot of psychotherapy before and after the sessions, uh, probably plays a pretty important role in, in minimizing risks and or maximizing the benefits. And a lot of retreat centers or guides give you pretty good support during the experience. You know, sometimes they'll do, an, you know, a, a, some preparation beforehand. They'll do kind of a, a next day integration session, but overall, they usually don't give you quite as much uh, support as you would in a clinical trial environment. So, you know, sometimes I get people that are consulting with me and, you know, maybe they want to go to uh, Amsterdam or the Netherlands and do a psilocybin truffle um, uh, retreat. And um, they're trying to heal some type of mental illness. And I just always encourage them to um, at least consider arranging extra pharmacological support, somebody else that they can access, whether it be a therapist, a, an integration coach, um, a trusted friend that has a lot of experience with psychedelics. You know, I'm not necessarily attached to who that person is, but I think that, you know, if things are, um, let's just say things go pretty well for you and you're integrating great. Okay, well, maybe, maybe you don't need that support. Maybe it will still be helpful to chat with someone about your experience, but I think, you know, really, you know, what if it goes sideways? What if you don't get what you want? What if it brings up a lot of really difficult emotions that you're still kind of grappling with and need to continue processing afterwards, where you're going to really thank yourself um, that you put that extra support in place uh, before you went on your kind of journey. So realistic expectations is another thing. I mean, psychedelics, quite frankly, are pretty miraculous drugs, but they're not necessarily miracle cures. And uh, when I see the media portraying psilocybin therapy these days, it kind of portrays it as well. You know, you go and you get cured of your atheism and you meet God and then you wake up the next day and you're just healed and, and you're just better and that's kind of it. End of story. Wash the hands. And uh, by and large, that's not my experience. I, I have when I talk with people about their journeys and what's coming up for them afterwards. Um, psilocybin, tryptamine psychedelics can be emotionally challenging. They can bring up intense anxiety. They can be physically uncomfortable, uh, less than 10% in, in clinical trials, but it has happened is that, you know, people actually uh, have transient psychotic types of symptoms like paranoia uh, or confusion. So I think the take home here is that, yes, we know from the trials that most people do get better. Uh, there is a pretty drastic and rapid type of uh, symptom reduction, but, you know, maybe as far as a realistic expectation, uh, it's good to tell people that are interested in this modality of healing that, you know, for a lot of people, it's the first step on a path and, you know, they're going to have to walk that path. And, um, you know, the journey from illness to wellness is, is essentially the, the hero's journey or the hero's path. And, uh, you know, it's not downhill with no obstacles. Uh, there's uh, um, a lot of work to do and there can be some really difficult things that come up to, to get around. So um, while they tend to, uh, get quite a bit better. Uh, I think it's um, a little bit misleading just to say that you're going to have this mystical experience and be healed and that's the end of the day. Okay, uh, so I just want to have one slide on the antidepressants here and uh, primarily the SSRIs or SNRIs. These are the drugs that uh, our first line right now, as far as if you go to the American Psychiatric Association's guideline, will say for depression, SSRIs. For anxiety disorders, SSRIs. For OCD, SSRIs. For PTSD, SSRIs. And since these are the indications that psychedelics are being studied for, it kind of makes sense that you're going to run into a lot of people that are either on SSRIs or withdrawing from SSRIs that want to use uh, psychedelics. So it kind of seems that in a pharmacology talk, we should have a slide on them. Uh, so it's really interesting with MDMA and SSRIs, we know that the MDA, MDMA won't work if you're on SSRIs. You just don't have much of an MDMA experience at all. There's some older data from the 90s that is 
mm, I don't know, I wouldn't say the strongest, but suggest the same type of blunting subjective experience effect with LSD. There's never been a formal study of SSRIs with psilocybin. If you just go to the internet, you'll get a mixed bag of reports. You'll get some people saying that, well, I think I did have a blunted or reduced experience. You know, you have other people saying that, you know, I got a lot out of it. I, you know, I, 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 I cried, I emotionally released, I felt very spiritual. So, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag as far as reports as whether psilocybin still has an effect when you're on SSRIs um, or not. Um, there are some more theoretical kind of reasons why you wouldn't want to combine SSRIs and psilocybin. There's a, a neuroscientific model that's kind of being, um, um, I don't know, brought to the world <laughs> by Robin Carhart Aris of the Imperial College of London. And, um, you know, he's kind of putting the model out there that SSRIs activate passive coping mechanisms, meaning essentially they help you tolerate a difficult emotional situation, whereas psychedelics activate active coping mechanisms, so kind of moving past a problem. And, you know, I'm not here to say which one is best. Uh, I think there's probably a place for both of them. Uh, but, you know, there's this question, it's like, well, if you're activating passive and active coping mechanisms at the same time, is that beneficial? You're more, you, you have more resilience as you make your active changes, or does it maybe retard your ability to make active changes because you're just kind of more apathetic and willing to tolerate your situation rather than kind of do something and, and change about it. So I think when it comes to antidepressants and psilocybin, we are gonna see more data come out. I know that there's a study plan that is formally going to look at this, but uh, you know, for now, I would just recommend reflecting on what your goals are. You know, If you're planning on combining antidepressants, psilocybin, you know, why is that? You know, if you're planning to taper off your antidepressant, um, you know, why is that? And, um, you know, I think that's just it when it comes to psychedelics and psychedelic uh, therapies is a lot of it is about um, intention and, and where you want to go. Okay, so let's go into some data here. This is uh, the exclusion criteria across several different studies. There are some kind of minor differences between the exclusion criteria in the psilocybin trials, but they are relatively minor. Uh, psilocybin does increase your blood pressure. There have not been any cardiovascular adverse events in clinical trials uh, from these cardiovascular increases, but they also have not let people with uncontrolled high blood pressure or advanced uh, cardiovascular illnesses participate in the trials. They've excluded people with epilepsy or seizure disorder. Uh, if they have a psychosis, schizophrenia, or a bipolar disorder in the trials, they're very careful. Uh, both people with personal histories and family histories would be uh, excluded. Uh, extreme psychiatric symptoms are typically excluded, things like active uh, suicidality or even history of a suicide attempt. Uh, they have this kind of uh, funny language in here, the fine print. A psychiatric condition judged to be incompatible with establishment of rapport with therapy team and or safe exposure to psychedelics. And, um, you know, kind of reading between the lines, I think the code words here are kind of around personality disorders or borderline, borderline personality disorder, which is a, a type of personality disorder where, um, you know, the person is usually in constant type of fear of, of abandonment, and it can be extremely difficult to establish a, a good rapport or, or a good relationship. And again, you know, you want to be doing this therapy with somebody that you, you know, absolutely trust. Uh, almost all concurrent psychotropics have been excluded, and, you know, some of these might be because there's really a risk of a, of a blunted or, uh, experience, and some of it may actually just be because they want their data clean. Because if you're on all of these other things that might also help and you get better, then the critic's always going to look at your study and say, well, but they were on these other things, so of course they got better. Or maybe they don't get better on all of these other things and then your trial's negative. And then the whole research agenda gets shut down because it's like, oh, well, that doesn't work. So in studies, a lot of the time, they're trying to do a pure experiment, which means excluding uh, a lot of stuff. <sighs> Medications that strongly inhibit or induce liver function. We kind of touched on the liver and, and kidney impairment when we talked about metabolism. And then uh, they have, excuse me, <coughs> they have not allowed uh, women that are currently pregnant to be in the trials. 
So, oh, my celestial heart, with your love that takes me so high, you teach me the way I can live, and you show me what it means to die. I just love this verse, and I just think it really captures the essence of psychedelic work in death and dying populations, and it certainly is an, an important place for psychedelics in the palliative uh, care world, and um, they've done several studies now in, in life-threatening illness, and I love this passage I, I found in this uh, paper. It was actually published earlier this year in the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs, uh, kind of giving a little historical uh, detail of where the origins of this kind of death and dying or, or palliative approach uh, to uh, psychedelic work uh, kind of started. And it seems that Aldous Huxley uh, was interested in this. And, and you see a quote here um, that he wrote about um, being bedside with his wife um, when she was dying. In a psychedelic experience is just, you know, absolutely beautiful. So mystical experiences seem to be a pretty hot commodity in the in the the world of psilocybin research. They're characterized by uh, four different domains: so sacredness and and positive mood, unity of all things, oneness, feeling connected with everything. Ineffability, so an inability to describe just how uh, incredible or sacred your experience was with words or, or a feeling that words cannot adequately describe what happened. And then a transcendence of, of time and space. So uh, essentially existing outside of yourself and you know, not feeling um, that you're kind of in the same type of ego structure that you normally have um, that knows you as yourself. Sometimes you hear this called a religious experience or a profound spiritual experience. They're synonymous terms with mystical experience. It's quantified by this questionnaire called the Mystical Experience Questionnaire. Um, and it has been reported with several different tryptamine psychedelics that they are able to elicit these mystical experiences. But uh, to date, it's best studied with psilocybin. So what is the role of this mystical experience in, in healing? Or, uh, you know, I have a picture here of the, the drop returning to, uh, it's a pretty still ocean, maybe a drop returning to the lake here, but you know, there's a lot of water molecules in a lake. Uh, most people rank psilocybin experiences in the top five most meaningful experiences of their lives. And this is pretty incredible because the average age of a person in these studies, are, they're in their forties and fifties. So they've seen some stuff. Births, deaths, marriage, divorce, graduation, wedding. They've kind of done a lot of this stuff by this age. And to have a, you know, quote unquote, hallucinogen or a drug experience rank in the top five most meaningful experience of your life at that age, I think really says something about how sacred and positive and profound uh, these uh, experiences are for people tends to increase the quality of the psychedelic experience. And uh, they found an association with the mediation of healing effects, the more mystical the experience, the kind of better the therapeutic outcome seems to be. Uh, it seems that the mystical experience is also associated with a, a, a change in the personality domain of openness. So more open to different thoughts, different ideas, uh, different experiences. and. Oftentimes depression is characterized by very closed and rigid types of thinking. So again, you can kind of see that, well, a loosening of the thought structure could be beneficial for some people. Uh, it seems to be associated with the persistence of the benefits. And then also the mystical experience seems to be associated with adoption of mindfulness uh, based activities or increased spirituality after the experience itself. So there's been three studies now that have looked at uh, psilocybin assisted psychotherapy in persons with cancer, uh, about 92 people total in these. Uh, they do one or two sessions, four to seven weeks apart. And, you know, again, of course, they have the uh, psychotherapy before and after. Uh, you know, for these uh, trials in life threatening illness, they included quite a barrage of different psychiatric conditions. So generalized anxiety disorder, anxiety disorder due to cancer, adjustment disorders, mixed anxiety, depression, and major depressive disorder. But the kind of the crux of it all is that you're staring down the end of your own life and you're kind of wondering about existence, life after death. Maybe there's a lot of regrets or, you know, things that you wish you would have done in your life or thought you were going to do in your life that you're kind of realizing that you're probably not going to be able to do. And it kind of puts people in an existential crisis. Uh, in these trials, they did allow any stage of cancer 
as long as the diagnosis was life-threatening and progressive. So some cancers are actually very, very slow growing. They're not really life-threatening. That's not the kind of cancer they're looking for. They're looking for progressive cancers that really are gonna threaten somebody's life. But the person couldn't be so ill with their cancer that they spend most of their day in bed, they're weak, they're unable to get up. So, you know, they had to be able to at least spend 50% of their time um, up and about during the day and, and, you know, less than half resting in bed. They did exclude cancers like brain cancers or, or cancers that have metastases that press on the spinal cord. Uh, also, uh, tumors that, that, that uh, secrete hormones, so tumors that are excreting things like epinephrine that are just driving up blood pressures really high are, are going to be excluded from, from the trials. Um, they were allowed to be undergoing uh, oncology-based therapies like chemotherapy, radiation, or biological therapies. They just kind of scheduled the psilocybin session so that maybe there were uh, a few days before the next uh, cycle of chemo, and that way, you know, their the post-chemo nausea and vomiting is largely passed. They're actually feeling fairly well. They also allowed long-acting opioids to be permitted in these in these trials. And the the kind of deal was is that long-acting opioids are taken every 12 hours and you're gonna take your opioid in the morning, then we're gonna dose your psilocybin six hours later, and then as the psilocybin's wearing off, you can take your next dose. So uh, you didn't have to stop the opioids, but you did have to uh, basically space the psilocybin as far away from an administration of one of them as you possibly could. So what are the results here? You know, they looked at both depression and anxiety uh, as endpoints. And well, what you see are, are pretty impressive results, the, uh, you know, five weeks to six months afterwards uh, for depression. So this is um, remission here, which is a, a more, a pretty robust marker of people getting better. Um, and what you're seeing is that, you know, 60% got better in the drug group in a one trial, 80% in another, it seems like 15 to 60% in the niacin or, or the placebo group. And then for anxiety, you know, 50% versus 12%. So, um, you know, these are very, very large uh, effect sizes. You know, we're used to seeing things more like 16% in one arm and 25% or something in another arm. Placebo usually performs pretty well in trials of depression and, and anxiety, but uh, you know, in these uh, psilocybin trials, um, it's very, very clear that psilocybin is uh, really improving um, the quality of life and the symptoms of, the, of these people. So other studies that are out there, uh, treatment-resistant depression. So the, it's really interesting to me, actually, that this was the indication that was given breakthrough therapy, because to date, there's really only been a single open-label study published on depression with, with psilocybin. So um, um, I'm glad that they did that, but I'm also um, a little bit puzzled, because really, the, the life-threatening anxiety with cancer has by far the strongest data currently. There are pilot studies for alcoholism, quitting cigarettes, as well as obsessive compulsive disorder. And then, uh, you know, do these trials have limitations? Yeah, absolutely. They don't have control groups a lot of the time. The numbers are fairly small. Um, you know, everyone knows that they got drugs, so it's not a double-blinded type of trial, but all the results have been positive and all the results seem to be uh, clinically meaningful. So you, you definitely have a signal at least that all of these other indications are um, promising. Let's talk about safety a little bit from, from these trials. And what you see here is uh, basically some kind of pooled raw frequencies of adverse uh, effects across different types of studies. Um, transient during the experience, it's very, very common to pe for people to, to uh, experience some psychological discomfort. You see the anxiety 17 to 100 percent. So that, in one trial, 100 percent of people had some type of, of transient anxiety. So that one's more of a um, you can expect it to happen rather than maybe it will happen. Uh, confusion or, or thought disorders and again like the, the kind of more um, psychotic symptoms like paranoia can occur, but they're typically way more rare than things like anxiety. Uh, interesting with psilocybin, because psilocybin is being studied for migraine or cluster types of headaches, but it seems that after the experience, the day after, um, you know, somewhere between a quarter and a half of people get some type of mild tension headache, can usually be treated with something like ibuprofen or, or a Tylenol if they desire to, to treat it. Uh, physically, again, 
psilocybin increases your blood pressure. Um, I have the kind of relative amounts that increases your blood pressure, or at least what we've, we've observed in, in studies today. You know, these are averages. Um, you know, obviously, if someone's having transient anxiety or maybe even kind of borderline panicking in their experience, you can expect their blood pressure and heart rate to kind of shoot up pretty high for a few minutes. But again, there's been zero adverse effects associated with these cardiovascular increases. Uh, vomiting less common, nausea can uh, occur pretty regularly, and also psilocybin causes a lot of physical discomfort. And uh, yeah, there's serotonin receptors in your brain, but actually 90% of the serotonin is, is in your gut. And serotonin two-way receptors are um, more or less every tissue of the body that we've looked so far that's in immune tissue, it's in muscular tissue, it's in the tissue that lines your blood vessels, as well as uh, neuronal or, or brain types of, of tissues. So, you know, maybe it makes sense. And I think like, like one frontier that I'm just excited about in the world of psychedelics is to understand more about uh, what the peripheral effects of psychedelics are on the body. Because um, I think that we're going to discover that it's, um, you know, while the psychedelic experience is the fireworks of the, of the mind, um, that, the, that the drugs have some healing properties in the periphery as well. So I kind of want to conclude here by just uh, giving you a peek at the research horizon. Uh, you can go to this website, clinicaltrials.gov, and you can type in just about any drug, and it will give you a list of trials that are uh, completed, ongoing, or planned. So I've kind of pulled the ones here that are kind of recruiting or ongoing or planned at the moment. And, uh, you know, up where you guys are in the, in the Bay Area or the San Francisco Bay Area at uh, University of California, San Francisco, they're doing a, a group psilocybin therapy study actually for demoralization in long-term AIDS survivors pretty interesting type of uh, contraindication. See uh, OCD getting a, a more rigorous study, double-blinded trial, uh, things like anorexia, migraines, um, you know, pulse traumatic headaches. Um, and the, the list kind of goes on and on here. Cocaine, cluster headaches, alcohol dependence, and, you know, a few again that I think are very sorely needed as we go into this paradigm of well, what if psilocybin gets approved? Well, you're going to get this tidal wave of people that are on antidepressants that want to try psychedelic healing, and it's going to kind of be critically important to understand how do we manage that situation safely? You know, is it, is it best just to continue? Is it best to taper them off? Um, what kind of support should they have during the withdrawal phase to get them prepared for this type of uh, experience? So, you know, there's a couple here, psilocybin versus escitalopram or Lexapro for major depression. And then, you know, effects of CERT inhibition or the serotonin reuptake pump inhibition on subjective responses to psilocybin in, in healthy subjects. So uh, I'm pretty excited about the, the studies that kind of dig a little deeper into the interactions of antidepressants with psilocybin. So to kind of summarize and, and conclude our, our talk today, you know, it's a re-emerging clinical modality for the treatment of various psychiatric illnesses and substance use disorders. Psilocybin is associated with ego dissolution or decreased activity of something that I didn't even talk about today, the default mode network. Uh, it's also associated with, with mystical experience. Psilocybin has an incredible safety profile from a physical perspective, just to be honest. I, um, I look at physical safety profiles of a number of drugs and psilocybin is just absolutely incredible of how physically safe it is. Uh, from the psychological perspective, of course, there's risks. That's why, you know, there's so much support in these trials for people that are trying to heal their mental illness. This is why set and setting is so critically important for uh, the psychedelic um, experience to go well. So, there's a lot of unanswered questions here around, you know, how much support does someone need? And okay, so far they've tried the set and setting in a, in a, you know, a mushroom room. But, you know, if you go to Arrowhead or the internet, you will find a lot of people that are saying, hey, you know, taking psychedelics in nature in silence is the best way to do it. So, you know, I think that there is even room to explore you know, what types of environments kind of um, are more suitable to different types of people perhaps, or, you know, comparisons between different types of uh, environments. So, you know, that's all I have for you today. Uh, let's see, we maybe have, I don't know, 
Daniel, if we have two or three minutes for questions, I'm just gonna spend maybe five or 10 seconds on each of these reference slides here. And that way in the recording, if you wanted to watch it later, hopefully I'll be pausing long enough that you could actually kind of pause the video and, and dig up the source that you wanted. Well, also, Ben, we're going to have an archive. Um, we have a forum at circle.tamintegration.com, and that's going to be sort of the home for resources if you're willing to share your slides. Sure. I mean, I signed the release that said I'm sharing. All right. So <laughs> we, we have some questions. Are you willing? Are you you're ready for some questions? Sure. Sure. Are you going to read them or do I have to read them from somewhere? I'll, I'll read them to you. But okay. um, before we do that, I do want to thank you for your thoroughness and for showing me pictures of um, molecules and things like that. I, I'm not a, I'm not chemistry literate particularly. It's not my huge interest, but so it is always good to, to dip my toe in these waters. And I think you did a great job. Thank you. So Corey says, I always get a runny nasal cavity and right eye whenever I do psilocybin, regardless amount ingested. Any ideas? Uh, I don't have a ton of ideas. I, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, well, I mean, psych is that psychedelics, again, these serotonin 2A receptors are in your blood vessels. And when they stimulate that, it constricts your blood vessel. Um, you know, there's also some thoughts that migraines are associated with, you know, dilation of blood vessels and, you know, pushing on structures. And that's kind of where the pain comes from. So I am taking a wild speculation here, um, but I'm kind of thinking maybe perhaps it has something to do with the kind of um, either vasoconstriction or dilation types of, of effects. But yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if I trust myself on that answer. Um, okay, fair enough. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know either. Yeah. Um, I'm currently on, uh, Adam says, I'm currently on 60 milligrams of fluoxetine and 300 milligrams of bupropin. bupropin. Yeah. What should I do about this in terms of preparing for a psilocybin trip? What about serotonin syndrome? Uh, so serotonin syndrome, you know, is really more about the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So, uh, you know, when people ask about antidepressants and psilocybin, I'm not worried about serotonin syndrome at all. Uh, you know, what I am pretty concerned about is the potential for a blunted or, or reduced type of uh, effect or, or, or experience. And, you know, probably the primary drug I'd be worried about there would be the Prozac or, or the fluoxetine. Well, butrin is an antidepressant, but it primarily works on dopamine and norepinephrine. So there's a lot less interaction potential predicted with something like psilocybin. Um, again, I don't know if it's ideal or it sh quote unquote should be combined as far as like depending on what your goals are. Um, but again, again, you're not going to end up with serotonin syndrome. And the risk is probably going to be a blunted or, or decreased type of experience. And what to do? Well, you know, this is why I have the consultations through the website, because um, what to do really depends on who you are, what your history is, uh, how easy or hard it is for you to taper off of these medications, what your goals are, you know, are you looking to see if psilocybin can just get you a little better right now and then maybe try to ta tackle tapering off? Or is it that, you know what, I want to fly my own and I want to get rid of these uh, antidepressants before I try my psilocybin. So um, that's exactly what we talk about in the kind of individual consultations and, and work those types of details out. But from the perspective of serotonin syndrome, there's absolutely zero evidence. There's zero case reports of antidepressants and psilocybin leading to intense serotonergic toxicities. Right. Cool. Um, oh, I'll answer this one just to, just to flip through. Do you know what specific types of music or certain song the trials use for set and setting? I've heard classical, but that's it. I want to answer that. If you Google John Hopkins University psychedelic playlist, it will come up on like 17 different articles. Done. Um, can you repeat the Aldous Huxley quote? Yeah, well... Not off the top of my head, but 
can certainly cruise back here really quickly. Here it is. I would ask her to open the eyes of memory to the desert sky and to think of it as the blue light of peace, soft and yet intense, gentle and yet irresistible in its tranquilizing power. Let go, let go, forget the body, leave it lying here. It is of no importance now. Gorgeous, thank you. A lot of information is circulating about the deceased production of serotonin from MDMA use. Is this information correct? And do any other entheogenic plants do a safe or similar thing? Sorry, it, it, what's the, the decreased production of serotonin or? Yes. Yeah, so, so MDMA releases serotonin. So it does deplete serotonin as, as a neurotransmitter. And there is a line somewhere between safe and toxic. We know from recreational literature that if you take high doses of ecstasy, maybe you're mixing with alcohol, maybe you're taking ecstasy that's cut with speed, and you do that weekend after weekend, we can find deficits in your serotonin neurotransmitter system after some period of time. In clinical trials, that doesn't seem to be the truth. In clinical trials, they use moderate doses. So the maximum they use is, at least right now, 187 and a half milligrams, which would be 125 to start and a 62 and a half milligram booster two hours later. They space sessions a month apart. They have not done more than three sessions in any trial. And with that exposure to MDMA, there has been no, efficit, no, um, no evidence of deficits in serotonin neurotransmission. And, um, you know, they have batteries of neurocognitive tests that these people are filling out as well. And there doesn't seem any cognitive deficits associated with it. So um, pure MDMA in moderate doses spaced a month apart doesn't seem to have this type of effect. Ecstasy in large doses on the weekend, every weekend with potentially other neurotoxins like alcohol does seem to have an effect. And you know where the line is between therapy type of MDMA and recreational type of MDMA, I'm not 100% sure, but that's what I got for you on that one. Cool. So Gavin says he has a bicuspid aortic stenosis with a murmur. Should I not be doing a PAP or doing a trip or a mushroom? What are your feelings on psilocybin and bicuspid aortic stenosis with murmurs? Oh man, you know, my feeling is that you probably want to run it by the cardiologist. Cause to me, I'm a pharmacist. My scope is drugs. I know drugs pretty well. I know psychiatric illnesses pretty well when it comes to things that are kind of advanced, like aortic stenosis, I'm not really sure. Um, Kind of my standard litmus test as far as cardiovascular things it's like okay well if your blood pressure is kind of normal and you can walk up three or four left flights of stairs without being exhausted and short of breath and having to rest you know halfway or at the top you probably have enough cardiovascular reserve to handle a psilocybin experience but yeah aortic stenosis is um maybe a tough one because there is this kind of well some psychedelics, probably more something like LSD than psilocybin bind serotonin 2B receptors. There were weight loss drugs in the 90s that were pulled from the market because they were thickening aortic valves. Uh, so yeah, that's probably more of a risk with microdosing drugs that bind to serotonin 2B receptors. But yeah, there maybe is some additional for heart valve thickening with repeated psychedelic use. and. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question fully. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. What about microdosing to wean off of Adderall? Well, there's no data supporting that it's, it's efficacious, but at the same time, um, Adderall is something that it's an amphetamine. It works on dopamine and norepinephrine. Psilocybin works on you know, serotonin. Um, you know, there's not really a predicted metabolic type of interaction between them. Um, so 
from a from a safety perspective, I wouldn't have any major concerns with with um, with you know if someone wanted to choose to do that. Um, but I can't really you know say I have some piece of data to to look at and say like yeah I think that's effective. You know it might be interesting because it because Adderall is a stimulant. Well, I mean, mescaline's a oh. stimulant. Mescaline has serotonin effects and mescaline integrates pretty well with the human physiology compared to something like MDMA, which tends to be a little harsher. So, you know, I might be curious to, to even think about like a San Pedro microdose. So Ben, I've tried to jam as many questions as yeah. I could in here, but we really have to go. We've got Robert Forte in about four minutes. Okay. Thank you so much for being a part Any of it. Any more questions? I do have drug information requests on my website again, spearpharmacist.com. It's been so nice to be part of the summit. Thank you so much, Daniel. And Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm glad we got past the technical difficulties and we're able to uh, do the presentation. Awesome. Namaste. Yeah, namaste.